Buck says ice cubes in my gin and tonic? Nah, thank you. I think I'll give that one a miss. Hello and welcome back to my channel. My name is Angela and today we're having a spoiler-free review of Cameron Hurley's God's War. This is the first in the Bell Dame trilogy. Um, so there are two more books. There's also a short story novella collection um, that's set in this world um, available. Um, this book does very much what it says on the tin or in this case on the cover because the war of the title is really what the book is centered around. Let's start with the world building. The bogs I mentioned at the beginning are actually a thing in this world. Um, and yeah, no, I wouldn't like those in my drink. And in general, if you have any problems with creepy crawlies, this might not be your book. Because the world we're in is very much based on, yeah, insect life. We're at some type of post-apocalyptic planet. Um, it's not clear if this is Earth or a different planet. It's a very harsh environment. Um, it's kind of very barren, desert-like. Uh, there is a lot of environmental pollution, radiation. Um, depending on which group you belong to, you might be lucky and get inoculated against a lot of the environmental hazards um, directly after birth. But that really depends on which group you do belong to. And anything on that planet that's like a type of technology is insect powered. Bugs are used for everything. If it's electricity or if it's um, transport like cars, um, it's powered by bugs, by parts of insects, by um, insect DNA. Um, so they play a huge role to keep this planet going. There are other animals on this planet, predominantly cats and dogs, but they're not the fluffy variety that we might have lying on a sofa cushion at home. No, um, they're the size of cattle and that's the way they are used as well. They're used um, as transport animals. They're used to pull carts and yeah, they're also on the menu. Also in this world, women have the upper hand. Men count for very, very little. They're mostly cannon fodder. If you're not an only son, you will definitely be drafted and sent to the front lines to fight. And not just for a couple of months, but for years. And most of those men, of course, do not return. Um, depending on yeah, which of those two war factions you belong to, um, you also might have not much in the sense of rights as a man, especially in Nashreen. Let's look at two of our main characters. So we have a female main character, Nix Nissa. Um, she is a Bell Dame. Bell Dames are a government elite unit of assassins and their main task is to hunt deserters. So they hunt down men who either try to evade being uh, drafted and being sent to the front or try to run from the front if they are fighting already. And not only do they hunt them, but they kill them. Um, the main reasons are, of course, yeah, to prevent more men from deserting, so like setting an example. The other main reason is if they have been fighting at the front, because in this war, a lot of biologicals um, and also, again, yeah, weaponry that has been developed using insects is used and can contaminate the combatants on either side. Um, and yeah, if somebody does a runner, then the likelihood that this man might infect others with whatever he has been contaminated with is very high, so they kill him. So it's a world that's not looking good for men, but it's also a world that's not necessarily looking good for women either. Um, 
it really depends on what group you belong to nyx is i'd say one of the more lucky women because she um, is in nasreen um, that's her culture her cultural background and yeah she is a woman that has basically all the power whereas in her culture men have nothing much to say um, she is very much let's say a gender swapped trope um, nix is yeah in down and out of luck war veteran fighter um, and she's a little bit a cliche in so far as she embodies a lot of traits that we would normally kind of like associate with this trope in a male form she doesn't really care what's the behind this war and um, what might be the motives of other uh, groups that are taking part in this war for her it's predominantly about what she calls glory even if at times she perhaps even doesn't know really what she means by that um, and yeah she is actually a woman with a male gaze the way she looks at man is really what we would expect from how men look at women in very patriarchal societies um, the way she treats men um, but also she is very indiscriminate when it comes to yeah who she um, takes with her and might get physical with apart from this how shall I say assassin job that she has um, also works as a bounty hunter and this is how um, we meet our second character Reese because he is part of her or will become eventually part of her bounty hunter team and this team is tasked with bringing in one particular woman and they're tasked by the queen herself and this is basically the plot already we have this war in the background and we have a team trying to bring in this particular person preferably alive and one of her team is reese reese is a man so he has already a low status because of that but he's also a foreigner because reese is from chenjan and chenjan is the opposing big party in this war so we have nasreen and we have chenjan and they're at war with each other there are a couple of other minor players but they don't get much of a mention um so he's singled out already on two counts he's a man he's a foreigner um he's visibly different than the others he's black even so everybody else in this world seems to be a person of color because darker skin protects you better against the pollutants that are in this world um but it doesn't get him anything of support or understanding from the people around him he looks different he sounds different he speaks with an accent um, and he behaves different because he tries very much to keep his identity his cultural identity and yeah the way he is he drives Nix up the wall she she can't stand him on one level both Reese and Nix have kind of like a more love-hate relationship there isn't much understanding for the other's culture they're very opinionated with their own way of life and they're also very yeah very judgmental when it comes to other cultures um the only thing about reese why nix wants him on her team and tolerates him is nix is a magician and that brings me to the magic in this world the magic in this world is yeah like everything else centered on bugs um, insects are king in this world and this goes for the magic as well a magician is somebody who can manipulate insects they're able to manipulate the pheromones of insects with their thoughts and you have to be born that way you cannot just learn this but you have to be born with the talent and then you can train up and yeah expand this talent and work on your skills so reese is for nix really more like a valuable resource um because in this world 
anything and anybody can be objectified and has a price of a sort. When it comes to the war itself, it's a holy war. Um, yeah, where nobody really knows anymore how it started, why it started. The bottom line seems to be that we have two cultures that have the same holy text that they're referring to. Um, but instead of seeing this as a uniting feature, the text is interpreted in such a different way um, that there are almost insurmountable differences. And um, the most clearly those differences become when it comes to how are men and women treated in each culture. We have Chenjan, Ris culture, which is very traditional um, in its gender roles. It's um, almost patriarchal. The religion, both religions the, um, that are fighting each other, are modeled on Islam, even so this is never mentioned in the book that this is the religion this is modeled on, but it's very clear by the vocabulary that is used. There are mosques, people are called to prayer several times a day. Um, also, women are described as wearing green clothing in the color of the Prophet. Um, so it's very clear the way how the world and the religion is described that the model for the religion is Islam, which is an interesting twist, actually, because a lot of the, yeah, especially American and European written um, fantasy that we encounter, if there is a holy war, it's mostly modeled on the crusade. So this is one of the things where this book actually differs and which I think makes this book a bit more interesting. Um, and then we have Nashreen. In Nashreen we have this in a gender swapped way. So it's not necessarily a better or more egalitarian world because now women have all the power and they're the ones who are calling the shots. Whereas we find men in roles and with behaviors that we would ascribe to women in our world more so than to men. If there is one thing that I find a bit irritating with this book, then it's this very cliche way how gender roles are described. Um, and this also goes then for our two main characters, that they're in some respects, yeah, a trope in not such a good way. Um, they get a bit more dimensional when the book progresses. And there are some nice ideas as well. For example, Nyx, on the one hand, she is this tough fighter woman, but she's also dyslexic and she's very insecure about this and tries to almost hide it or at least gloss over it. Um, so it gets a little bit better when the book progresses, but at first it is in some respects very cliche. Also this yeah, holy war that at the same time is a gender war. It ages the book in a way that I found a bit surprising because it's something I would expect more in, let's say, 1960s science fiction, perhaps. Other themes that are explored in the book apart from war um, and, yeah, gender roles and the exploration around that, um, we have the um, question of love. And we get kind of like other explorations about what love might mean um, and how it might change people. We're also looking a lot at sacrifice, sacrificing oneself for religion or a god. And I think this is one of the themes that makes this book again a little bit different and also a little bit better because in a way, we're presented with the viewpoint of the sacrificial lamb. So we're not just having people who willingly sacrifice themselves because they're convinced they're doing the right thing and dying in this war and therefore dying for God is the right thing. But we're also confronted with a point of view where somebody is told you have to sacrifice yourself even so they don't want to. And I think that's a very interesting discussion as well that's happening in this book. Overall, in its world building and the setup of the world, this book reminded me a little bit of the Mad Max films, now where we also have a 
post-apocalyptic world that's scarce of resources. Um, when it comes to the writing style, I was very much reminded of the early William Gibson, so the cyberpunk William Gibson. And um, Cameron Hurley describes her particular kind of like genre that she seems to want to explore as bug punk. And yeah, she seems to have at least in part modeled her writing on William Gibson as well. Um, that's okay, but like with how the gender war is described, it's a little bit surprising because it's a writing style that goes back one, if not even two decades. Um, this book was published in 2011, but in parts this read more to me like something that was from the late 80s, early 90s. And I think it has a lot to do with the style. And as I say, also this at parts, um, yeah, almost a bit outdated way of thinking about gender. But despite of this, I think the novel has a lot going for it. Um, it's definitely different from what I've read so far. It's a very interesting um, exploration in parts of its themes, even though it might be a little bit over ambitious in parts. But then this is the first in a trilogy and it's, think it's very much a set up book. Um, the plot strands are all um, satisfyingly tied up. So we get a solution to the mystery and the bounty hunt that's going in, on in the book. And that's like its main focus. So all this is resolved at the end of the book. From a genre point of view, this seems to be like a mix between yeah, science fiction, but not a very hard science-y type of science fiction, um, military fantasy, and let's say with a little sprinkle of grimdark. It is not really grimdark proper. I mean, the world is harsh and demanding. A lot of the characters express that they have no hope. But I think the ending of the book especially um, points into a different direction. And there's an element in this ending um, that makes it, I think, quite hopeful. And I actually, I personally liked that element a lot. So I will definitely, I think, read on. And yeah, I hope that this could interest you a little bit at least as well. So thank you for watching and till the next video. Happy reading and all the best.